Hi everyone, a very good morning and welcome to our Speed Masterclass in March 2021. My name is Felicia Liu from SFPM Consulting. In brief, SFPM Consulting is a consultancy firm that helps food manufacturers build a strong food safety program and tap into the process improvement easily. Our Speed Masterclass intends to help our audience to learn how to optimize their operational and food safety management system. Today, we are very pleased to have Alan Funston from Sension Consulting. We're talking about eight ways in the food industry. Alan Funston is a professional engineer, management consultant, and Lean Six Sigma Black Belt practitioner. He's a, a business leader and founder of Sension Future Consulting. Alan has saved individuals and organizations 251.4 years and over $4.7 billion by helping them define weight and apply what they value to empower fulfilling regret-proof regret decisions. His expertise includes decision management science, business process improvement, leadership management, project management, and change management. The only thing that Alan cares about life is saving you time so that you can live a, a, a fulfilling regret-proof proof life by your standard. Welcome, Alan, and thank you for sharing with us today. Thank you so much, Felicia, for having me, and thanks, everybody, for uh, coming to the presentation today and, and joining us. So, as Felicia mentioned, we'll focus on the eight wastes, uh, in particular, as they relate to the food in industry today. Uh, let's uh, dive right in. Uh, and afterwards, we will have a, uh, a few minutes for uh, questions and answers as well. So what are the eight wastes? Uh, so these were developed primarily through uh, Toyota's production system in the 1970s and 1980s, related primarily to manufacturing, but they, they also do relate to anything that moves, any process. And so we find them quite relevant across a variety of industries and contexts. And, and again, today, speaking specific, specifically about the food industry. So what are some of these eight wastes? Well, there are defects, there's overproduction, waiting time, unused skill, transportation, excess inventory, excess motion, and overprocessing. And so we'll look at what each of these are in turn uh, and offer some examples both in the uh, manufacturing and sort of packaging side of the food industry as well as the uh, service side, uh, namely restaurants. So let's look at defects first. So what's the problem effectively with defects? It's production that does not meet your quality standards and so therefore can't be sold or, or used. So in the packaging uh, industry, that might be spoilage or damage or you know, misprinted labels and the like. Uh, as far as preparation is concerned, let's say in a restaurant environment, obviously spoilage remains an issue. Uh, if dishes are prepared off recipe or off temperature, then they might be rejected at the table and again, relate, uh, uh, create waste that, uh, that costs money and time. So what are some of the solutions to defects? Namely, looking at the root cause of some of those symptoms as you identify them and as other people identify them, and then creating standard operating procedures that minimize the likelihood that those defects uh, recur. So we're ultimately looking for consistency there. Overproduction. So when there's more supply uh, that is produced rather than demand. In the uh, packaging side of the food industry, you can imagine you know, a minimum batch size of you know, packaging materials and maybe you have very few orders, but, you know, you had a thousand boxes as the minimum order and you just end up with, uh, you know, buying more than you need. In the restaurant industry, you can think of similarly large batches of, you know, soup or chili or, or other um, dishes that are made that, you know, one thinks they, you know, they might need to be made in such large quantities. Uh, and maybe there are only a handful of orders for that dish. And so the rest can go to waste. So what are some of the solutions to overproduction? Specifically, identifying ways to create flexible batch sizes, I think is really important. So uh, identifying when there are, you know, a handful of orders, what can we do to scale up or scale down the recipe, scale up or scale down our purchases, so that, you know, we don't um, have, you know, more ingredients than we need, uh, or, you know, our, and that we're not stuck producing more than we need. Another option is mass customization. Uh, that was a really interesting topic where uh, you might have similar ingredients or similar 
uh, raw materials that are used across the different things that you make and you add them at the last moment and that can minimize the variability in your uh, in your supply. Waiting time. So, you know, when more time passes than is either necessary, objectively, or than is expected, which is more of a subjective concern. In the packaging side of the food industry, you can think of the, you know, a, a batch being complete as you know, part of a manufacturing line, but maybe the packaging line for that batch or for that food is not yet ready. And so the, the product sits there waiting and, and so might the, uh, the people be involved in those steps as well. In, in restaurants, you know, you can imagine the ovens possibly being at capacity for the particularly busy night and next orders are ready to be cooked, but they don't have space in the oven yet. So uh, those orders take longer to get to the tables. Long, ideally, I guess that ends up being a longer lead time than is expected by the customer. So one way to address waiting time is to look at the system bottlenecks, right? Uh, what are the steps that take the longest? Uh, and uh, dictate the maximum flow rate right, of your product uh, you know, through the system. And another way to help with that is also manage expectations. So even if you're doing exceptionally well, uh, objectively in the kitchen, as it were, sometimes uh, you know a really busy night can mean that things will be a little bit longer than, than usual. And of course, having our expectations managed, I think, goes a long way in terms of uh, improving the customer experience and, of course, repeat business. Unused skill. So the problem is you know, when colleagues can create more value than they actually are, right? And this is typically that their skill set extends beyond what they're being asked to do in the workplace. In a packaging environment, maybe the packager is actually a trained mechanic. You know, could they be uh, finding new ways or identifying new ways for the equipment to work more efficiently or more effectively? Uh, and similarly, in, in a restaurant environment, possibly a line cook actually has some specialties around dessert. And one of the ways to really solve this problem of identifying and utilizing unused skill is to have broader conversations with our colleagues about what are they good at and what are they passionate about? If they are, if we have these broader conversations about what can they do as opposed to just what the position requires, then there are a lot more opportunities to maybe take advantage of the other skills they have and to possibly be more innovative in you know, the workplace. Maybe they bring fresh ideas or a deep understanding or expertise that uh, could be applied that we hadn't thought about. Transportation. And so we're thinking more or less large scale here. So unnecessary moving of goods between locations. In a packaging environment, this might be something like uh, you know, direct to store, direct to consumer uh, you know, manufacturing, where there is a lot of different trucks or, or delivery vehicles uh, that go into many different directions you know, from the manufacturing environment. And you know, that can be a waste of gas. It can create long lead times. It can make it expensive per unit shipped. Uh, whereas if there are uh, local distribution warehouses, so you can send you know, one large vehicle to an urban center and then it gets distributed from there to restaurants or or grocery stores, uh, that can do, go a long way in terms of minimizing the transportation cost per item. And in, similarly for the uh, the restaurant environment, you can think of imported versus local ingredients. Uh, local sourcing, right, can greatly minimize the uh, cost of bringing in those um, bringing in those ingredients. And ideally, there isn't a uh, you know there's there's equivalent quality, or you can adjust recipes and the like to use local ingredients uh, to be, you know, as, as desirable of a dish, but at the same time, uh, you know, having that sort of sustainable local um, availability uh, that can uh, make the supply chain a little bit more uh, reliable as well, and not just to mention uh, cost-effective. Excess inventory, really, the issue with excess inventory is that it really ties up money that you have already spent in raw materials and or finished goods that can't be used uh, flexibly elsewhere. So it's, it's working capital uh, that, it, that it ties up. So in the packaging industry, you might have excess uh, boxes or a, a full warehouse of, again, either raw materials or finished goods just waiting to be shipped or waiting to be used. Uh, and in the restaurant, there might be you know, excess ingredients. Maybe you've bought a year's supply worth of something, but the lead time on it is only two weeks. 
you know, maybe it makes sense to only have a couple of months supply on hand uh, and to leave that cash in the business for other things. The, you know, similarly, it's not uncommon to pre-make certain parts of certain recipes so that they're available for, you know, faster delivery and faster creation of dishes uh, when a customer orders them. However, there's, there is a, a, an extreme to that where uh, you might create so many sort of pre-made batches that that takes up a significant amount of space in, you know, the fridges or there's possible spoilage uh, involved there too. Um, there's a bit of a risk. So, so what are some of the solutions to excess inventory? Ultimately, understanding your demand pattern better. If your demand is really steady, great. Uh, try to keep, you can keep relatively low inventory levels because you don't have to deal with the variability. Uh, if you do have um, highly variable demand, then uh, it's helpful to know that and then gauge, you know, what is the, what is the cost of not satisfying, you know, perhaps those occasional peaks in demand uh, is that a relatively small cost compared to being prepared 100% of the time? Um, sometimes being prepared all of the time for even those massive peaks is more expensive than, you know, losing the, the opportunities that come with those peaks. And so there's a, there's a certain amount of risk aversion that as an organization, you know, it's worth asking yourself about, uh, you know, what percentage of the cases um, or, or you know, around demand do we cover? And that can uh, influence your choice of how much inventory, inventory to keep. Excess motion is similar to transportation, but it's a little bit smaller scale. The issue is largely when there's unnecessary uh, movement of people and products, which just takes, uh, takes time and there's an opportunity to cost to that. What else could people be doing with that time? In the packaging uh, industry or environment, you can think of packaging lines possibly not being in sequence, right? So maybe there are three or four steps to the production of a particular um, good. And maybe, you know, after step two, you have to go all the way around the other side of the plant to do step three before you come back to, to where step two ends and you do step four. That's unnecessary movement. And similarly, in a, in a restaurant environment, you can imagine maybe the oven being really far from the customers, the fridge being somewhere in the middle, the food you know comes out of the fridge goes you know gets prepared goes over to the oven and it's just doing unnecessary movement um you know through the kitchen and that's not just in the source of inefficiency in, in a lot of these environments it can also be a safety concern because you get people traveling in different directions uh, possibly bumping into one another uh, it's much uh, easier and more efficient to put your uh, steps in sequence uh, physically so that the flow is very um sort of clean and, and uninterrupted. And lastly, we have over-processing. And so this is time that is spent, uh, or, and time energy that is spent that doesn't add significant extra value or that has decreasing marginal returns. In a packaging environment, this might be you know excessive wrapping or inspection. Of course, wrapping products is, is important, packaging is important, inspection is important. But once it has been wrapped adequately and it's not likely to have any accidents or it's been inspected adequately and it, it meets standards, uh, it doesn't need to be, you know, that you don't need to continue doing that. Um, and it, it really just wastes, uh, wastes time. Around food preparation, uh, you can think of foods marinating for longer than they need to or, or cooking longer than they need to. Maybe the food hasn't spoiled, maybe it still meets standards, but if it occupies the ovens for longer than it needs to, to, to meet those standards, well, then that's an opportunity cost that the oven has uh, and that the team has to possibly be doing other things, cooking more dishes, having a higher uh, capacity for the restaurant or minimizing lead times uh, for delivery of those dishes to customers. So what are some of the solutions for overprocessing? Largely, it's around defining necessary durations uh, for those process steps. So if something only needs to take 10 minutes, can you get into the habit of making sure that it only ever takes 10 minutes? Uh, or that only every 10 minutes is spent on it. Um, and the more consistently that can be done, the more you open up the, your resources, um, both people and uh, tools to be able to work on other things, uh, you know, the next steps, the next products, the next dishes. Uh, and then ultimately uh, execute consistently. So the, um, the summary of the eight wastes here again, uh, as it relates to the food industry, are, are defects, overproduction, uh, waiting time, unused skill, excess transportation, excess inventory, excess motion, and over-processing. 
And the goal here is a process in which the right amount of the right goods are made at the right time by the right people for the right people without unnecessary movement or inventory. With that in mind, um, I'd like to uh, you know, open the floor to any questions you might have about the eight wastes or <clears throat> you know, specifically as they relate to the food industry. If you have any uh, specific or general uh, questions uh, that relate to, to your experience or your context, uh, I'd love to uh, help in some way if I can. Thank you. Is there any questions? Thank you, Alan. It was a fantastic uh, learning experience uh, with the eight ways and how to fix them. I have a quick question uh, to get started. So what yes. is the first step that you will recommend for us, to, uh, anyone thinking of reducing waste? Right. So there are two first steps that come to mind. There's probably one that comes to mind more so as a default for most people, and that is where are we losing the most money, right? And you can certainly look into those eight sources of, or eight types of waste and uh, try to identify which of those is, again, objectively losing the most money for the organization. Uh, however, and, and it's important to do that, of course, I'd argue the other first step is more influential though. And that is really asking stakeholders. And so that's your colleagues, that's your customers, that's your, you know, your manage, management or investors or leaders, what have you, what are their frustrations? What are their, what are some of the symptoms that they're observing that they don't think need to be there that they think can be addressed, right? This is what's actually causing, um, you know, let's say decreased quality of life uh, or quality uh, of, sort of the workplace. Um, and I'd argue that, you know, the, you're going to get greater buy-in, greater support for solving those issues first, because those issues are known and recognized and painful. Um, and they may not be, at least at first, the ones that are causing the most, you know, uh, you know, financial loss, but in, uh, I guess in resolving those issues, uh, you'll get a lot more support for ongoing uh, improvements and you can always address the more financially impactful ones later after people start adopting this workplace culture of of continuous improvement and realize that you know you've been asking and listening and caring about what it is that they have to say um, and, and that political support can go a long way in terms of making sure your organization has uh, you know long-term success uh, in um, in what it is that it does Fantastic. Looks like it's tied in with our food safety culture and building uh, human resources that are able to voice out and uh, provide that feedback for the organizations to look at what waste is, in, uh, is there and also providing some solutions from the team member as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think it really, uh, a workplace culture where people feel safe in offering that feedback and supported by leadership and management um, is, is critical because that feedback is exactly where the opportunities lie and people need to feel um, you know, safe and encouraged uh, to, to share that, so. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Alan. I just wanna make sure that we answer all the questions on the floor. If there's no other questions, I would, uh, let um, Alan leave the floor and we'll see you in the next time. Any questions? Counting once, twice, third time. Well, thank you so much, Alan, for your presentation today. You sure learned a lot on the ways and how to manage ways uh, and the tips, certainly. Uh, we would be sharing this presentations soon when it's ready. So be sure to check it out. Uh, oh, we have a question. So yes. the question is, can we really over inspect when it comes to auditing and controlling quality processing? This is kind of because they, um, the audience find out that certain kind of quality checks are so imperative that one has to check beyond the stipulated frequency sometimes to in order to achieve quality production. So can we always back, basically? So, so that's a great question. Um, 
inspection is is critical, right? So, so let me start with that. Um, it is, of course, important. Um, and it's important to the degree that you are confident in the quality of the good, right? And if, you know, there is a, a stated need, right, for inspection, and typically that's done, and occasionally uh, there is, you know, a deeper inspection that is done to further ensure the confidence that you have in the standard amount, then great, you know, whatever is necessary for you, the, you know, the organization or any of the stakeholders to feel confident that the uh, product is to, you know, an acceptable or, or above acceptable standard is, is perfect. Uh, the question, I guess, really in terms of excess becomes um, once you're confident, right? And once you know how much inspection is necessary for that confidence, then inspecting beyond what is necessary to be confident uh, is uh, d- does become wasteful, right? Um, I'm, I'm certainly an advocate for doing the proper inspections and uh, you know doing deeper checks as necessary and, and you know questioning every now and then uh, whether these standards uh, are still appropriate. Um, but you know, anything really done in excess uh, does become wasteful, uh, so long as the um, yeah, so long as you're achieving your your quality assurance or quality control objectives, um, then then you can you can move forward because um, ultimately at some point it does need to go out the door. Yeah. Fantastic, great answer. I would add to that to your questions. I think one of the things that we do in the food industry is we do internal audit. And that really helps you identify what exactly uh, is working and not working at your facility in terms of verification and validations. So you may be able to look at your verification and validation procedure and to make sure that when you're checking, your your, uh, method of checking is working. If your method of checking is always consistently working, then you may be able to reduce some, uh, reduce or just be happy with what you have in terms of quality inspection point. All right, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen, again. It's great having you here. We'll have the presentations made available uh, sooner uh, within this week. I will share it out to our audience. So thank you so much, Ellen. Thank you so much for attending uh, this short webinar. Thanks, Felicia. Thanks, everyone.